Um, hi, everyone. Uh, so I'm very happy here to be on the happy occasion of the happy birthday for <laughs> Avi. And this is, uh, I have a bunch of pictures of Avi, but that's the only one of the two of us together. It's from Heidelberg a few years ago. So um, I was actually a graduate student the same time that Avi was, but Avi was in Princeton and I was at Berkeley. I heard about him, but I, haven't, I didn't meet him. And by the time he came to Berkeley for a postdoc, I went to MIT. <laughs> So the first time that we really kind of uh, were in the same place and we got to know each other is when I went to uh, Hebrew University for a sabbatical in 1987. And I, uh, I was very excited about the sabbatical from per for personal reasons. I, w I didn't live in Israel for five years at that point and it was just for me a, a very, uh, it was a big thing to go to Israel. But I really never imagined that it was gonna be also a great scientific <laughs> uh, period. And that was really due to interactions with Avi. So I, I came to Israel and I had uh, lots of plans of things to do. And I, I was in Hebrew University also. But about, I think the first week or so, um, Avi asked me a question that at that time a lot of people were asking say, after they proved that uh, NP is zero knowledge, if they're one-way functions, and these GMW, uh, Goldrock, Mikhail, and uh, protocols, um, the, it was what else is there to do in cryptography? I mean, the field is over. And that was kind of a common question at the time. And, um, and you know, I was a little startled by this question. <laughs> and usually I'm pretty good, I, the only time I, I can actually think is when I'm threatened. Uh, <laughs> so, so it's like, ah, okay, uh, well, I said, maybe you don't need to make assumptions. Maybe you can change the model and impose some sort of physical conditions on it and then we can get results without assumptions. And that was the case and we had some nice, very nice works together. I mean, I like them. Anyway, uh, so happy birth, ah, one last story. And that is, then we became friends. But years later, I really started liking him. I mean, I liked him before, but this time, it was, you know, <laughs> it was going to really, it was very personal and significant. And that is that Avi came to visit us with his son, Yuval, and uh, Yuval was less than a year old. And my, I, have, I have a child around the same age, and he was extremely, my child, very anxious and very neurotic. And it was like, oh, what am I doing wrong? It's my parenting, you know, I'm not easygoing enough and so forth, but Avi's very easygoing. So he comes with this boy, and the boy is sitting on him, and he keeps on saying, ah, bah, 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 bah. <laughs> So people, <laughs> he would not, he was like the most anxious child you've ever seen. I'm like, oh, you know. <laughs> it's, it's, I was, I, was, I was really happy, and, and I was really kind of calmed down because it was clearly not me, you know? Um, <laughs> but apparently since then he's really calmed down and he seems, he seems pretty reasonable now. Okay, so, <laughs> and so has mine, by the way, so. Uh, okay, so now I'd like, I guess that's it, and um, I'm gonna tell you about uh, these new pseudo-deterministic algorithms. So uh, pseudo-deterministic algorithms is something that's been inter interested in me for the last few years, actually since a birthday to Lovas many years ago. Not many, but uh, was it a six? <laughs> was it 60? Was it 60? It was 60 also? Okay, so it was a, while, a little while ago. <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> Are you jealous because you couldn't uh, switch it? I'm going line by line. <laughs> Yes, um, and this is joint work uh, with Ophel Gossman, who is, uh, who is a student at MIT. And, uh, okay, so I'm gonna talk about it, uh, a, a different type of randomized algorithm than most people are familiar with. So most of us um, think about probabilistic algorithms in the way that uh, we think of the class BPP, so these are decision problems for which there are algorithms which work, uh, which are randomized and, and give you the correct answer with high probability, but probably most of you have seen it for the first time uh, when you are taught primality testing in an algorithms class. So there's this beautiful algorithm that tests primality by, um, and gives you the right answer <coughs> with high probability. Okay, and uh, uh, the, this, I think this question of pr probability of primality testing has led to major ongoing de-randomization efforts essentially for the last 30 years for this question, is P equal to BPP? Namely, can every problem that has such randomized solution also be done deterministically without randomization? And Avi has been a major part of this revolution or uh, effort, and starting with his work with, uh, with Noam in 1984, and then the big breakthrough in, in, uh, with uh, Russell in, in 97, where they showed that the answer is yes, if exponential time doesn't have small circuits. Um, so that's a question that people have been studying for a very long time. Since then, primality has been, 
put in P, even though it's still our best example for probabilistic polynomial time algorithm. In fact, almost the only example, uh, natural example. So there is another one, which is polynomial identity testing. And um, these are sort of the, this is still the one that's there. And um, what I want to talk about today is a different kind of randomized algorithm. And in particular, I want to switch from decision problems and talk about search problems. So rather than testing whether a number is prime or not, I want you to think about a, a search uh, question, such as you have a graph, you want to find the minimum spanning tree, or maybe you have a size and you'd like to find a prime of that size, okay? So we're actually <coughs> searching for an object rather than deciding whether it has a property or not. And uh, when you think of these, there's lots and lots of problems, actually. It can be formulated this way for which we have probabilistic solutions, but we don't have deterministic solutions, probabilistic that are correct with high probability. And here are a bunch of them, like finding a prime, finding generators for cyclic groups, uh, computing square roots mod p, doing q roots, finding points on elliptic curves. All of these, we don't know deterministic solutions, but we can do very easily with probabilistic algorithms, so we can find these objects. And uh, there are also basic steps in cryptographic constructions, and that's how we do it, right? We use probabilistic algorithms. And in fact, it's not just, probabilistic algorithms aren't just useful for solving sequential problems, but they're useful for parallel algorithms, in distributed computing, in, in sublinear algorithms that are very fundamentally important, and so forth. And the traditional goal in most of these, all of these subfields, is if we have a probabilistic solution, wouldn't it be, be it's better to have deterministic ones, so we're trying to de-randomize, we're trying to find deterministic solutions for things we know how to do probabilistically. Now, in, for a lot of these, questions, it's not that we don't have a deterministic solution, but maybe the probabilistic one works better. Maybe it's faster, maybe it's uh, efficient in some other, pro in other ways, much more than the deterministic ones. Maybe it has features that we like. So what I'd like to talk about today is something where, in some sense, I'm saying, okay, maybe this is not necessarily the, the goal, or at least not the only goal to focus on. Maybe we can focus on a different goal, somehow achieving what the deterministic solutions give me, but not necessarily finding a deterministic solution, okay? So that leads us to think of what is it about deterministic versus probabilistic that really distinguishes them. So there's the running time, but usually they all run in polynomial time. There is the correctness, and deterministic will always be correct. With probabilistic, we'll say correct with high probability. Maybe that's also okay. There's one thing that's very different, and that is the deterministic solutions always give you the same output, okay, on the same input, because they're deterministic, but the probabilistic ones, especially for search, will might, may give you many different solutions per input, depending on the randomness used. So every time you run it again, with different randomness, a different solution can come up. So that's a very big difference in somehow, which seems like a conceptual or inherent difference. That is that you cannot necessarily expect at all to get the same answer again. So what I'd like to do is to, first of all, uh, tell you that I think that unique answers, I mean, everybody would, uh, or reproducible answers matter. So there is a difference here between deterministic and probabilistic that is of significance in several, in many settings. Uh, so here's just some sort of uh, settings where you could see why it would be better to always get the same answer rather than get a completely different answer. And let's say if you're thinking about debugging or in a distributed setting where algorithms want to get the same answer without communicating to each other which randomness <coughs> they use and they would like to make sure that even though they're using a an algorithm and, they don't, and it might be randomized, they'll get the same answer. Uh, checking correctness of the locating computation. So let's say I give a computer some my input and it's giving me back the answer, and uh, every time it runs different randomness, it's gonna give me a different answer. It's gonna prove that one. It would be nice somehow if I knew it was the same one, I could maybe just give it to five different people if they gave me the same answer I know. It gives me some confidence that it's the right answer and so forth, and definitely for generating parameters for a cryptographic system where you might suspect somebody's putting some trap door for you, and you would like to make sure that regardless of what randomness, is always gonna be the same output, and therefore they cannot cheat you in some way by using special randomness. So this leads us to talk about these algorithms that I'm talking about today, which have been around for a few years now, uh, and they, these will be randomized algorithms, okay? Still, we're tossing coins and we're efficient, but we want to answer the same answer, we have the same output with high probability. So regardless of the randomness, most of the time, there's a majority answer that comes up, okay? Uh, or another way to think about it is that you won't be, somehow I would like you not to be able to tell them apart from deterministic. They won't be deterministic, but you can't tell the difference. 
So if you'd like a picture, and that's why we call it pseudo-deterministic, uh, if someone is on this side and he sees this type of algorithm, a real deterministic one, or one of the pseudo-deterministic ones, just from input-output relation, he cannot tell them apart. Because on the same input, he gets the same output, so it's just for an intuition. <coughs> so formally speaking, the definition is sort of obvious, right? So this is where Heran Gat, who was a, a student at, in, um, he was a master student in Weizmann, uh, we wanted to run quickly. We want the probability of being correct to be bigger than two thirds, just like for BPP. But in addition to that, we want to say that there is an output that when you take the probability over the coins, will come up with more than two thirds probability. We can think of it as canonical. So it's not always unique. It's not even always correct. But with high probability, it's correct. And with high probability, it's the same. It's this Y answer. Are we good? We're good. OK. So why is this a good notion? So for one thing, now you can do things like amplify the correctness of this algorithm. So before, if every time I say I, 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 I couldn't test when the output is correct, I just know that two-thirds of the time it will give me a correct answer. So every time I run, it gives me a different answer. How do I know which one is the correct one, which one isn't? In this case, you can, uh, with this type of class, you can amplify correctness. You just run it again and again, the majority answer is going to be uh, that Y. Uh, so whereas classically, for BPP, for Monte Carlo, it's not true, here it is. It's not a bit. What do you mean? No, no, it's a it's a search no, no, no. algorithm. It's all search. It outputs. Think just if you'd like to think of an example, you know, th it outputs a prime. You give it a size, it gives you a prime bigger than that size. Okay. Yeah, that's the thing that you should keep in your mind. It's generating a prime rather than testing that something is a prime. Okay. Uh, another uh, question that this sheds light on is the question of derandomization that we mentioned at the beginning. So as I said, P versus BPP has been studied. A very important and intensely studied question. You could also ask the question, what about search P? So the algorithms that find uh, answer a search problem versus search BPP. Again, algorithms that find the answer to a search problem, but they toss coins. And they're correct with high probability. There's several ways to define this. Let's just think about the intuition of what you would want to define this thing to be. And it turns out that the relation between these two questions is, is not obvious. So it could very well be that tomorrow people prove that P is equal to BPP by some method, and it will shed no light whatsoever on whether search P and search BPP are the same. So one could be true and the other could be false. And in particular, if again we go back to that primality question, if all I care about is the following, I give you a size N and I want you to find for me a prime bigger than N, <coughs> okay? And this is trivial in a randomized way. You choose a random number between N and 2N, most of, a lot of them are primes, and you test it for primality. This is a random prime. But uh, even if you assume that P was equal to BPP, we don't know how to make a deterministic procedure that gives me a prime bigger than N. We know how to choose a random and then test. That's not deterministic. Okay, however, it's pretty easy to see that if P is equal to BPP, so if you could settle the decision problem, then Every pseudo-deterministic search algorithm can be converted to a deterministic polynomial time search algorithm. So in other words, if you did know that P is equal to BPP, then in particular you could, uh, and you had an algorithm which was pseudo-deterministic to find primes, you also had a deterministic algorithm to find primes. So you can, con they are the same. The search problem and the decision problem are uh, uh, resolving the derandomization in both cases would be the same if you restricted yourself to pseudo-deterministic algorithms that have a unique solution with high probability. Good? So it's, in a sense, there is some bridge here between the decision and the search P versus BPP question. All right, and why is this? I won't say, but uh, I mean, it's very easy to see, but not kind of tangential to, to the talk. Uh, but it's part of a general characterization. So it actually turns out that every pseudo-deterministic algorithm, so the kind that outputs one solution with high probability, is reducible to some BPP decision problem. So you can think of it, of what the algorithm would look like, is it there's a deterministic algorithm, then he asks questions from a decision oracle, which can be decided in probabilistic polynomial time. So it's an if and only if. So it's also true that if you're reducible to such a decision problem, then one can come up with a pseudo-deterministic polynomial algorithm. So all of these algorithms, if they exist, will look like this. <coughs> Which decision problem is unclear? But there is some decision problem, okay? So that you can think of your algorithm as going on deterministically, then asking uh, some decision question which can be solved probabilistically with high probability, okay? All right. So uh, just one last thing in general, then we'll get to kind of the new <coughs> result. And that is another observation for these algorithms. 
are the following. Suppose I have an, a deterministic algorithm A, and it has some subroutine which is randomized. And it calls it every once in a while, on different inputs, and, th and so forth. Then I claim that I can reuse the randomness that I, uh, when I run these pseudo-deterministic algorithms. So if you think about it, I give it an input, and it has some coin tossing. I claim it can use the same coins over and over again on different inputs. Why is that? Because the state of the algorithm essentially is going to be independent of the randomness. So when it gets the answer back, it's always getting the same answer, most of the time, not always. Let's say two-thirds of you amplified it. And um, it doesn't know. The answer doesn't encode the randomness that was used. So you can use that randomness again. That is not the case for general randomized algorithms. When you get the answer, if it's different answers for different randomness, you cannot claim that later on you're going to run it again. It's going to be independent from run to run. So you have to use new randomness. So these stand the chance to be more efficient from a randomness point of view, from reusing the randomness point of view. OK, so it's all very nice. It will be nice to have them. Now, do we have them? So we have some sequential examples. Um, and the one of them, the first one, which, I, which I, this concept actually kind of occurred, is uh, a talk that Lenstra gave in Lovas' birthday. <laughs> but he was talking about canonical. So he wanted to find a unique a quadratic non-residue in order to talk about um, finding irreducible polynomials, which are unique. And uh, he wanted a really unique one. So here we, we liberated this uniqueness. Liberated, a relaxed. We're not requiring it to be unique. We're requiring with high probability to be unique. And uh, so there are some sequential examples. Then they're in sublinear setting. So then in Dana, um, a, we have some also separation between pseudo deterministic algorithms, probabilistic algorithms, and deterministic ones. But today, what I want to tell you about is a new result about pseudo deterministic parallel algorithm. Okay, so we're going to show how to do a bipartite perfect matching algorithm, which is randomized, but will output the same matching with high probability over the coin tosses of the algorithm. Good? So that's where we're going to. So now we've understood the notion, and we're going to design an algorithm which has these properties for perfect matching, for bipartite perfect matching. Okay, so the NC, the problem is solvable in uh, polylog parallel time with polynomial many processors. And RNC, they also use coins. So we've got all these processors. They want to work in parallel time, and they can toss coins. And I want to say that in this context of parallel algorithms, actually, uniqueness seems to be more important even than in the sequential case. Because, in a sense, the main, intuitively speaking, a big problem is how are they going to coordinate? They only have polylog and time. How are they going to coordinate with each other to give you a solution? And another problem I am told by Charles Lyson and so forth is that in a parallel setting, debugging is a big issue for randomized algorithms. Because somehow, if you rerun it again, there's these things that happen, and you don't get the same results even when you have the same randomness. I'm not sure I understand this completely. But um, in any case, in both, on both accounts, these should be easier, easier to coordinate, easier to debug if there was a unique solution with respect to which they are working, the processors, okay? Or that you knew that every time you run it, the same solution would come up, then at least if there was, you know, if there was some sort of consistency while you're trying to debug these. Okay, so the problem that we will attack is matching. So we're gonna have uh, a graph and we were looking for a set of edges that don't have uh, such a no vertex is adjacent to more than one edge. And important distinction is going to be decision versus search. Okay, so one question is, is there a matching of a certain size? And another one, find the matching of that size. And that would be a big distinction for this talk because we're talking about the search problem. And for the sequential polynomial time case, there, this is a rich history. Um, so Edmund, who's sleeping over there, is, uh, um, uh, I think that the matching problem was one of the reasons to um, to uh, introduce the concept of polynomial time. And uh, then there's Dick and John Hopcroft. There's a, a, a Karp Hopcroft famous algorithm. And even I encountered matching through Silvio and VJ when this was, uh, I think, the first result in first year grad students. So in any case, sequentially, this is very well understood, has had motivated a lot of concepts in, in, in algorithms, in complexity theory, and so forth. We're going to look at a parallel case. Okay, we're gonna look at the parallel case and we're gonna look at just bipartite. So we have schools and students and we wanna match schools to students so that they have, each school has one, no, each student has one school, okay. Um, I guess that was, I had, well, whatever. 
All right, so the red guys are in the matching. And just as matching had a lot, it had a lot of influence in the sequential case, it actually had, uh, no, we skipped something. Oh, maybe in a minute. It, uh, uh, okay, so let's talk about bipartite matching for a second. Also here we can talk about decision versus search. So if we think about decision, it has a beautiful, whereas the, in the sequential case, the algorithms are you know, very graph theoretical, very combinatorial. When we go to the parallel world, they're randomized, they're algebraic in nature. So if we think about this simple graph here, um, and we, there is a, a matrix, which is a simplified version of the top matrix, which uh, is analogous to what happens in this graph, where we put a variable, if there is an edge between two nodes, and we put zero if there isn't one, and it turns out that the determinant of that matrix corresponds to the matching, perfect matchings in that graph. So in other words, for example, this matching that I have there is exactly between three and two, two and three, and one and one, so this is this non-zero term here. So in fact, the non-zero terms corresponds to the matchings in this graph, and the decision problem of whether there is a perfect matching on this graph is the same as whether this whole determinant is a zero polynomial or not. <coughs> and a Lovas a, a shows here that in order to decide then the perfect matching problem, you just have to decide whether the determinant is non-zero. So you have a probabilistic procedure to do so, and one can do this in parallel. Now you probably are asking why sometimes I put pictures and why sometimes I don't. Maybe you're not asking, but I asked myself this morning, I said, Shafi, why aren't you putting more pictures? So I understood my own algorithm. So the algorithm is this. If you're in the audience, I try to put your picture. Uh, if you're a co-author, I definitely put your picture. Now, there might be people in the audience which I don't know about, and therefore your picture is not here. So that's, I hope, good enough. Um, all right, so the decision we know how to do in randomized NC. But the question that we're asking today is search, right? We say we won't search pseudo-deterministic algorithms. So the search problem actually is also trivial uh, if, so it reduces the decision, if there's a unique matching in the graph, unique perfect matching in the graph. In that case, you know, for each edge, we essentially take it out and see if there's still a matching. So the decision and search are the same if there's a unique one. Alas, it's not unique. So I think there's like, I don't know, in factorial or exponential number of um, possible matchings in the graph. So this problem, you see, Dick is here, and Ellie, I decided I'd put him in anyway. Um, so, so this problem, I think, was the, f uh, uh, was the first problem? I don't know if it was the first, but one of the big problems that came out of Avi's postdoc, which is that the search problem is also in R and C. They show how to solve this in parallel polylog time, polynomial <coughs> number of processors, okay? But this was not just uh, an isolated result. There then were a sequence of papers. There was a paper by Karloff that showed how to do it in Las Vegas. And then another paper, which I will focus on more because it's more relevant to our algorithm by Mamuli Vazirani Vazirani. Okay, so what's the point here? I have to give you the insight a little bit into it. The point here is this. We had this bipartite graph. There's exponential number of matching, say, and we know it's easy if it was unique, okay? So somehow, in this work, they want to sort of make it unique. But how do they do that? They say, well, let's isolate a special matching. It's not, there are many, but I want to look at one. So how are we going to do that? We're going to put weights on the edges. Before it was unweighted. We're going to put weights on the edges, and let's look for a matching of minimum weight. And they make two points. One is, if the weight assignment that you gave induces a unique minimum weight matching, then they show how to find it. Okay, so it's a randomized procedure that shows how to find that unique one, if it is unique. And secondly, and I think this is what is famous, this paper is just, it's very elegant and, and very well known for something called the isolation lemma, where they show how to make the weight assignment such that it will be unique and then you can find it by the previous step. So how do you make it unique? If you choose the weights of each edge at random from the set of one through number of edges, uh, squared, I guess, then with high probability, there will be unique minimum weight matching, okay? And then we're done, because you just choose the weights at random, and then you find it, done, okay. I said the word unique many times on this slide. The thing is, it's unique per the randomness, not per the graph. So for different weight assignments, there'll be a different unique one. What I want is that on the same graph, same uh, matching for my pseudo-deterministic randomized algorithm. All right? And that's what 
we want to do. Okay, but just as a review of the history, really since that paper, I think that most of the pa works that are trying to take the randomized NC algorithm that exists and make it deterministic NC, so finding matching in the graphs by the de a deterministic algorithm <coughs> in parallel, they work by trying to de-randomize the isolation level. So there's some ways to take that beautifully simple idea that works and find that weight assignment, not at random, but de by deterministically, that isolates, I'm okay? that isolates <laughs> the matching. Um, what? Okay, okay. Uh, I don't know, maybe starting, no, no. Uh, <laughs> so there's all these cases, and then there was a paper that was just uh, recently, beautiful in the last talk, I think it was presented, uh, where they show a quasi-deterministic NC algorithm, which essentially de-randomizes the isolation lemma and solves by partite perfect matching deterministically, but uses more than polynomial number processors. Okay, so what I'll show you today is that by using uh, an idea here we, and more, we don't, we have another algorithm which doesn't de-randomize. <laughs> it's randomized, but it unicifies, okay, the, um, the matching in, uh, in RNC. So I say, you know what, let's just say there is randomness, but we want to get a unique solution, and that's what we will do. Okay. So uh, here's the idea of the algorithm. Step one, so it's sort of an overview. So we will still construct weight assignments for the edges, and that will be done deterministically. So there will be some way, which I'll mention in a few slides, how to label the weights in a deterministic way. But once we have them, okay, the, the new step, in a sense, I mean, the weight assignment is also different than what they did in the previous paper, but conceptually, kind of big new step is that now we will give a procedure for finding the union of all these minimal matchings with respect to this weight assignment. So there might be many, no more than one. I just want to find the union of them. What does the union mean here? Think about it that I throw away all the edges that didn't participate in any minimum weight matching. So the new graph is smaller. So I'm I'm going to find this union, it's going to be, it's one, the old graph deleted a bunch of stuff, and then I'll repeat. And again, I'll throw away a bunch of stuff. The idea being is, I, I throw away, throw away, throw away, now the graph is going to be so simple that it'll be clear that deterministically how to find a matching, and then we will we'll go back. And so it will be clear sort of how to work ourselves back deterministically to a unique matching. Okay? All right, so note here, this is a randomized algorithm, because this step is randomized, but it will be pseudo-deterministic. So there will be only one unique answer. Why? This step was deterministic. This step, it's randomized, but there's only one un union of all minimum weight matching. There's only one solution, so that's the one we'll find. And therefore, the answer will be, at the end, unique. Okay, so how do we do this, the union step? So the union step really is just, um, we actually, we don't know how to do this deterministically, not in quasi -R, and seen or whatever, but randomized won't be so difficult because what we'll show is a procedure where every edge essentially by itself decides if it participated or didn't participate in some W minimal matching. So on his own he can decide that, okay? And how does he decide that? So here's the procedure. Essentially, uh, you can determine what is the weight of, what is the weight, not necessarily a matching, but what is the weight of the W minimal uh, weight perfect matching, and that can be essentially used the Malmoli Vazirani Vazirani paper. They had a procedure there to do that. And that's randomized. And then you construct a new weight assignment where everything is the same except for that one edge that you would like to know that participated in any minimum weight matchings with respect to W, you make his weight a little less. And you determine the new uh, weight. If he never, if he participated, Obviously, now the weight has gone down, but it's also vice versa. So if he didn't participate, it won't. So one has to argue it, but it's essentially tr trivial. Okay, so every edge can decide whether he participated or didn't participate, and now we have the union. The guys who didn't participate, they disappear. The only question is how many edges did we, dis did we get rid of? Okay, did we get rid of enough? Okay, so that this whole thing could progress. So, uh, this is really the next step, which is how do we construct the weight assignment to make sure that when we do this step, we get rid of enough. Okay. So uh, our goal is 
to come up with a weight assignment that makes the union small. Because <coughs> we keep going, and it becomes small, 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 but at the end, let's say, left one. And um, this is where this work of FGT was crucial. And the idea here is sort of the door to this, is that they say, let's look at cycles. So if we look at this graph, there are two matchings here, the straight black lines and the red lines. And obviously, they're both, if they're both minimum weight, their weights are the same. Um, and there's this notion called circulation, which is the weight of the odd edges. In the, there's also a cycle here. Um, and you can talk about the sum of the weights on the odd edges and the sum of the weights on the even edges. And the circulation is a different in this sum. So since they're, if they're both minimum weight matchings, the difference is zero, so, because they have the same weight. In fact, if you had a weight assignment for the graph that gave non-zero circulation, so when you do the odds minus evens for every cycle, uh, you get something <coughs> that's uh, non-zero, it will actually mean that it induces a unique minimum weight matching. Okay, but these FGT guys, they actually s uh, prove something more interesting which is they say that if you look at the union, okay, so forget about the previous slide if it was too confusing, but if you look at the union of all the minimum weight matchings, perfect matchings of a bipartite graph, it will only contain cycles which have zero circulation. So if you look at the cycles and you take the odds minus the evens, you're gonna get zero. Okay, so the union is such. So here's a strategy. It would be great to construct a weight assignment such that all cycles have non-zero, and therefore they won't make it to the union. And so the union somehow has gotten rid of some edges, because we had cycles before, now we put weight assignments, uh, such that the union won't have any cycles. There we go. Um, see, it's a, it's a curse. Um, maybe I should ask the guy to start. Uh, wait. So I'm in the National Academy of Engineering, but this is probably too difficult <laughs> for me. I, know, I think I, I did it, but maybe the wrong way. So let's just see. Well, how do you know? Maybe <laughs> okay, thanks. Okay, so it would be great if we could. <laughs> it's not me, as they say. Uh, here. Okay, so uh, it would be great to come up with a W. Oh, wonderful. So it would be great to come up with a weight assignment that all cycles will be non-zero, and then they won't make it to the union, and we're good. But we can't do that. Instead, we'll construct a weight assignment such as all small cycles, where small is defined less than four log n, vertices have non-zero circulation. And then that means that the union will have only long cycles, because the small ones don't make it. Okay, now how, this is an intuition. How do you make it into an algorithm? Uh, use a lemma by these guys um, that says uh, that, uh, see? <laughs> I will, actually. Um, <laughs> that's so nice. <laughs> Such a pleasure. Okay, so, um, which says that if, um, that any node graph whose shortest cycle is long, it has at least one-tenth of its vertices of degree, at most Not. two. <laughs> so in other words, these, these graphs that have only long cycles, an additional thing that you can say about them is that there's a lot of vertices that have small degree, okay? So this gives us a procedure. We're gonna construct the weight assignment, such that the union of matching is all cycles are long. That means that there's a good fraction of the vertices which have small degree. And when we are now in the situation of a small degree, now we know what to do next. That is how to simplify these graphs. And um, there you go again. So how do we deal with graphs that have nodes that have degree one? That's no problem, because we know that this guy's in the, in the matching, right? Um, so I, essentially what I'm showing you here is that we can simplify and we still will be able to recover. We simplify, 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 we still have a matching that we can recover. Mm -hmm. So these are the guys with a single degree one. What about degree two? So that's not as simple, but it is really. You can contract them, you can find, let's say you found a matching in this graph, you could recover a matching in the previous one. So you have to decide whether to put that edge or that edge, and in parallel you have to be a little bit careful, but it can be done, okay? So this is not, 
significant, but the p issue is that there is a procedure to simplify the graph again and again when there are a lot of vertices of a small uh, degree. Now, I just want to say that even in this stage, Avi is actually significant because this was a, I saw a talk on this FGT result in Oberwolfach, and uh, I couldn't understand, uh, Amir gave a beautiful talk in the sense that I understood that this was important and lots of other ideas, but not everything. <laughs> but the fact that I understood something from the talk, that was already a big thing. In any case, then I took a train with Anoop, and he explained to me one of the, a simpler proof that was uh, apparently thought of by Amir, Avi, and Anoop. So thank you, and I won't go through it. I just want to say that Avi had something to do with it. <laughs> okay, so in any case, I still didn't tell you the important part, which is what about what weight assignment? There has to be a weight assignment for which it's true that, um, that all small cycles have non-zero circulation, right? So we can get rid of them. And this is the weight assignment. Uh, which is essentially to take the name of the edge, which goes from one up to length, the number of edges, to the power k. So what do I mean by power k? There won't be a single weight assignment. There'll be a sequence of them. So there'll be, the first one just gives a, the weights to be just the name of the edges, the second one squared of it, <coughs> cubed, and so forth. We do this log n times. And the guarantee is going to be that one can prove is that the cycle, um, there, this, as, uh, any cycle, small cycle of length less than four log n can't have zero circulation with respect to all these weight functions. Okay, so it can't be. So if we did this union with respect to each weight assignment, one after the other, one of them is gonna kill every cycle, small cycle. So eventually all small cycles will be killed. And essentially to prove that is just sort of an algebraic thing. Like you think about the cycle, then the condition of having z uh, zero circulation meant that the sum of the even costs and the sum of the odd costs are the same. So this equation has to hold for all these powers of k, because we try each weight assignment at a time, and he won't be able to. There will be a violation just by algebraic counting. OK, so we, we're done. We create these weights um, that kills all the small cycles. We construct the union each time, and, the, and it's getting small and small. We contract, we repeat, and then we get to a constant size, we have a, a matching we can build up again. So it's clear why it's correct, because when we do the union, there's always some perfect matching there. OK, we haven't gotten rid of it. And when we contract it, we know how to go back. It's randomized, it's in NC, and it's pseudo-deterministic, because the union is one. OK, now what about randomness, by the way? How much randomness are we using here? So as I said, we can reuse randomness. Okay, so if we wanted to amplify this, we could reuse it again with the same randomness. Uh, so what are some corollaries? So if tomorrow somebody shows that NC is equal to RNC, then also finding a bipartite perfect matching can be done in NC because of this relationship between decision and search for pseudo-deterministic <laughs> algorithms, right? So if it's pseudo-deterministic, it's actually deterministic if the decision problem. By the way, we did reduce the decision problem here. What was the decision problem? Is for an edge to decide if it was in a, any minimum weight matching or not. Okay, so if that could be done in NC, the whole thing is in NC. And there are some other problems which have been shown previously to be equivalent, essentially, to this matching problem, and any one of these can use this and get a pseudo-deterministic algorithm. Uh, how much time do I have? None? Well, I probably don't need five minutes. But in any case, I want to say that, uh, let's go back to this idea, so this offer no a notice, ah! I seriously didn't do anything. <laughs> I mean, how could I have? Uh, hmm. Okay, it's a magical. A ah, okay. <laughs> okay, so suppose you wanted to solve another problem, uh, like uh, g given a regular bipartite graph, you wanted to find all, uh, the disjoint uh, matchings, okay? So in a graph that has it, you wanted to find all the, the disjoint ones. Um, and you wanted to do it using as few random bits as possible. So one way to do it is just find the perfect matching using order log n squared random bits, let's say like in the Malmoli Vazirani Vazirani, remove it from the graph, repeat. And uh, if you wanted to look for d matchings, you would have to use d times log squared n randomness. If you do it pseudo-deterministically, <coughs> pseudo-deterministically, yes, um, then you do it once, you know, you find it, you remove it from the graph, and you repeat, and you can use the same randomness. So it sort of immediately gives you a more efficient, in terms of randomness, algorithm, since you can reuse the randomness. So I'm done. What are the open problems? The probably nicest open problem here is how to find uh, a prime of length n, given n, 
pri prime between n and 2n deterministically, uh, which I think the best that's known is something like this, to the square root of n. What? It's a good question. I think it, it's, <laughs> it's to the square root of n, plus or maybe something, to the square root of n. And uh, the question is, uh, can you do better than that? Here, this little, oh, little, um, let's get, it's like something depends on, disappears with, this, with n. So just think of it this way. Uh, and uh, this is a specific problem, but maybe more uh, questions are, uh, of course, go from bipartite matching to general matching and try to find the unique one. Um, so that's the top problem. Then there's some number theoretic problems. You can ask a more general question, and is, is there like a black box reduction between Las Vegas or pseudo-deterministic, or sure it doesn't exist? Uh, maybe you could relax this notion of pseudo-determinism to suggest some notion of stability. That's something that sort of trying to think about uh, for randomized learning <coughs> algorithms. So they talk there about stability, giving different example sets. Do you get the same algorithm in the sense of what it classifies? Uh, maybe you could use this uh, to come up with some notion. But the main message is that you know reproducing uniqueness, I think, it really is fundamental <laughs> to algorithms and science uh, in face of noise and randomness. But my takeaway is de-randomization is not the only way to get it. So you might be able to get reproducing even with, with randomness. 